So I, I think we, we should uh, start, uh, to, otherwise it's going to be too late. So welcome to uh, this event organized by Our Future in Catalonia. Um, the event is uh, in case someone wants to change you know, to a different uh, room. Lessons from newly independent states and international overview of the Catalan process. My name is uh, Carlos Bosch. I, uh, I'm a native uh, that uh, happened to be around these weeks and I have been asked to chair this. I have also, uh, I mean, it's fully disclosed in the uh, paper you may have seen. I have been, I'm a member of the advisory council of, of the, on the national transition organized or set up by the Catalan government. And uh, I have been basically asked to chair this, uh, and uh, we have with us Anna Stanic uh, to my uh, left, uh, um, who is a specialist on uh, secessions, uh, and originally from Slovenia, worked for the uh, for the, uh, the Slovenia uh, government, and now um, I think she's a, a lawyer. Well, she's a lawyer in London. Uh, and then to my right, Elina Villup uh, 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 has worked uh, in the European Union, uh, fundamentally advising on the, Europe, on the Eastern enlargement and also working on questions related to external trade of the European Union. And Elina comes from Estonia. And the, what we are going to do basically is that we are going to, uh, for about uh, 55, 60 minutes, perhaps a bit less, so that you have a chance to talk, to ask questions, we are going to engage in a conversation, um, the three of us. Uh, I'm, I'll start by asking a few questions and. Uh, you know, the idea is to develop a, a dialogue, and after that, we'll sort of invite everyone to ask uh, questions uh, after this discussion. So um, I think that there are a lot of uh, topics on the table, and uh, what I would like to uh, do is to uh, talk about um, becoming independent and talking about the experience of, uh, um, in this case, Slovenia and Estonia and in general, the smallest states in Europe that became independent in the last uh, 25 uh, years. Okay. And then from there, I think we can move to the question of the, uh, a independence and um, membership in the European Union. And finally, another big topic would be the role of smaller states in the world. And in general, this question that I think is interesting and sometimes not talked that much about, which is the, the differences between the ways in which small and big countries behave, uh, both internally and externally. What are the differences? What are the kinds of things that make them different? What are the kinds of challenges that the smaller states have? And so on. So let me go to the first. Uh, sort of block of questions and talk about becoming independent. And so start the conversation with this question of how did it happen uh, in both uh, Estonia and Slovenia? And uh, I'll ask uh, Elina to, to, to start talking about you know, Estonia. What, what happened? How it was it? Since I think that in a way Estonia is similar or closer or Catalonia is closer to the case of Estonia, since Slovenia was pretty homogeneous. In Estonia, there were more differences, and mm. so it may be interesting to reflect on the internal process that happened in, uh, in, Slo in Estonia. Okay. Um, hello, good night. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to you to, uh, about Estonia, my, my, my native small country. Um, I haven't been living in Estonia for a while, so it's especially a great pleasure to, to talk about my, 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 my country. And especially here, which is the, the native country of my husband and also my, my little daughter. Um, Estonia has actually been independent twice, has become independent twice during the 20th century. It first became independent in 1918 as a, as a result of the end of the, of the First World War and the aftermath of the world. It, it used the, uh, the opportunities presented uh, by, the, by the collapse of the, of the, of the international system at, at that moment and, and became independent, starting a, 
a, a, a few years war against Russia, which it, uh, or Soviet Union at the moment, which it uh, won quite, quite surprisingly. And so it managed to be independent until 1930, 1940, when it was uh, occupied by the, by the Soviet Union. So in order to understand the Estonian independence process, and I would argue that it is actually very different from what we're seeing, seeing here, it is, it is important to understand how the Estonians see, see themselves and see their independence process. For the Estonians, the Second World War ended in 1991. So what, what, what is seen, what, what happened to us between 1940, first the German occupation and then the, then the then first the Soviet occupation, then the, the Nazi occupation, and then again the, the, the Soviet occupation from, from which started with the end of, of the Second World War, is, is something that, that the, the majority of the Estonian population lived as, lived as, the, as the extension of, of the Second World War. So when, but when in 1985, so, and I'm, I'm going to speak a bit more about that because I think it's just, it's important also to give a bit of the flavor of the time. In 1985, when Gorbachev, um, because the Soviet Union was falling apart, um, the economy was falling apart, apart because the gas prices were low, the command economy was functioning, the state would not um, uh, uphold the, the military expenses that it was um, has taken on. So if you think about the military expenditure of the Soviet Union, for example, was 25% um, of, its, of its GDP compared to the 6% of the US, I think, at the time. So immense defense spending um, and the economy was was falling around 50 percent by the year, by the time by 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 the end of the, of the 1990s. So in 1985, Gorbachev and the, and the Communist Party comes up to the bright, bright idea of, of moderni modernization, the perestroika and classness. In Estonia, the population was really unhappy at that time, already frustrated because there were shortages of foods, there were shortages of products. And in general, the people were not doing very well. So 1985, when Gorbachev comes out with this fantastic idea of Glasnost in Perestroika, and in, in, and in the 1980s, were very uh, hard for the Estonians as well. Russification was going on. Um, the political atmosphere had, had, had become quite difficult again. It's, it, was, it was much more strict when you compare, for example, to the, to the thaw of the 1960s. In the 1980s still, and I remember it from my childhood, when we were forbidden to, to, to celebrate Christmas. You could go to prison for celebrating Christmas. So if I would celebrate Christmas at home, I would not be allowed to speak about in the streets. Or if you would celebrate Christmas at home, you would have to close the, the curtains very, uh, very tightly. My birthday is on the 22nd of December. If I would hold my birthday party on the 24th or the 21st of December, no one would show up because they were afraid of, uh, of repressions. And I'm not that old, so 1980s was still quite um, quite a difficult time in the Soviet Union. So when Gorbachev comes out with a fantastic idea of Glasnost and Perestroika in 1985, people did not really listen to him. What what started and or did not take him very seriously. What started the independence or the pro autonomy movement going in Estonia was 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 altogether a different matter. The Soviet powers had a brilliant idea of, of opening a phosphorite mine. In, in Eastern Estonia, which started protest, and actually the Estonian independence movement started from that protest movement, because it, to this protest movement, also the, the professional associations of writers, of uh, intellectuals tagged, tagged along later as well. And already at the end of the 1990s, the, the key year was 1988. Already in 1988, the, the, the first the popular movement was created. Um, uh, in, uh, later, later in the year, also the first uh, political party in the Soviet Union was created. It was called the Estonian National Independence Party. So the things started rolling on, but at the beginning, it was more about autonomy than about independence. However, the things um, started evolving extremely rapidly. One of the key um, factors in this was that the local, so local Communist Party was supportive of this popular manifestation. In 1988, um, the, Soviet, the Central Communist Party had um, replaced the, the leader of the local Communist Party, which had been very unpopular with, with, a, with the Estonians, and replaced him with someone who was much more favorable. Little did they know that this person would actually take a side of, 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 the, of, the, of the people on the streets and would start supporting radical ideas. So if you, just to give you some examples, and during the 1999, 
it's still a Soviet supreme, decreed Estonia the national language in the territory of Estonia, accepted the Estonian national flag as the flag of Estonia, and, and also put forward a couple of other um, rather, rather radical ideas of, for, that, for that time. Um, so 1988-1989 were important, yes, there was, these were the years of the singing revolution, something that was not repressed because of the role of, the, of, the, of what, the, what the local uh, communist party played, they always defended the, the, the people, and also, and also be, because of, of, of when, I, when I think of, of back to this time, it is actually very difficult to understand why the, the Soviets did not put tanks on the, on the streets, because Estonia was, is, is a, is Estonia was, at the time, the Soviet border region, and it was heavily militarized. So the, the tanks stayed in their in the, uh, the bases, and the Estonians were in the streets, peacefully protesting against the legality of the Soviet power on the Estonian ground. Estonia managed to get independence actually as a result of, of, the, of an accident. Again, it was the second accident during the 20th century. Um, and it was the August Putsch in Moscow. The Estonian Soviet Supreme, again, took the advantage of the situation and declared Estonia independent. Estonia could only manage, and this is what I wanted to, ma to mention earlier as well, in, in, January, in, January, 1990, in January 1989, Bloody events and took place in, in Latvia and Lithuania. Estonia was spared. One of the reasons why Estonia was spared was because it, of its excellent relations with, with, the, with the Russian Soviet Republic, and especially with, its, with, with, with Boris Yeltsin, who came personally to Estonia to guarantee that nothing would happen in Estonia. Nothing happened in Estonia. So when Estonia declared itself independent in, in 1991 in August, as a result of the August Putsch, when it, when it came to the recognition, and I think we have to, we will talk about it later as well, Estonia's good relations with the, so with the Russian Soviet Republic, they played a very important role. Thank you. So, so let me ask you this question. So in this process that happened so quickly, so there was this unraveling of, um, of everything, right? Um, in Estonia, there is a significant Russian-speaking minority, and so what was the, how was this, how this that the, that the played um, that you know that sort of um, the existence of this minority in Estonia? Uh, were they in favor of independence or were they passive and acquiesced? Uh, why is that you said? Why is that Russia didn't do anything? You know, we know now that. Um, Moscow today sort of plays with these ideas of, uh, you know, the Russian uh, minorities in um, the Baltic countries. They even go and hijack uh, officers of, uh, or at least there was one that dis someone disappeared and then Estonian. reappeared. Um, Estonian, that is something important to mention as well. At the time when the Estonian, um, Estonians started to mobilize, also, the, um, there was also anti-movement. So in 1988, 1989, also the, the, mainly the Russian-speaking population started to mobilize against independence and more auton autonomy for, for, for Estonia. The movement that was created, is, it was called the Popular Front, was mostly placed on the trade unions of the workers of the big factories. And it, it, and it played, uh, played an important role. There were, there were some clashes between the Estonian manifestors, manifestors and, the, and the Russian manifestors, but it never became anything important. Everything that happened in Estonia between 1988 and 1989 was rather peaceful. The um, this Russian minority, although I don't think you could actually call it a minority at the time, because if you think that Estonia formed a part of the uh, of the Soviet Union, and although so, although the Soviet Union was a federal state according to its constitution, I think we can safely argue that it was nothing but. So actually, the the, the Russian speaking po population in Estonia at that time rather saw themselves as a majority and the Estonian as a as a minority or an ethnic minority. So. 
so clearly there was this this there was there was this discontent and this this population Estonia is still um, a rather homogeneous country I think compared to Catalonia Catalonia has a much uh, more mixed ethnic um, composition than Estonia does Estonia is around when um, around 70 percent are ethnic Estonians and the rest around 25 percent are ethnic Russians and the, and the remaining five percent are Ukrainians Finns and and various smaller smaller nationalities at the, at the moment so the so the people who were unhappy about um, about Estonian reindependence of the and the and the and the aspirations of the eth of the Estonians were mainly Russian speakers with Soviet passports, and they were were to also become one of the losers of the of the independence process. <laughs> So I don't know if I answer your question. Okay, let me let me go to to Anna. So, Anna, the, you know, at least we thought here, you know, at that time that Yugoslavia was different from the Soviet Union, right? So, mm. the Soviet Union was a totalitarian or you know, country, or at least a post-totalitarian country with a uh, you know, sort of very hardline uh, communist party and so on. Yugoslavia always sold itself as a federal state where there were these nationalities that were sort of equal. Do you think that um, that it, that was not the case or and uh, or, or, or it was different and do you think that under some circumstances Yugoslavia could have become a place where the Slovenia would have been uh, happy uh, or was uh, independence unavoidable? Uh, no, I don't think independence was unavoidable at all. Um, I think the the big similarity between, in my view, between Catalonia and Slovenia or Yugoslavia and Spain is that the origins of the debate are constitutional and economic, and they're the, they were the same in Yugoslavia. So really independence for Slovenia was an emergency exit. It was at the point in time when there was no other option. So it was something that happened very fast. Um, it, the issue of independence wasn't mainstream before 89. It actually didn't become at all something that the public supported before June 1990. And we had the referendum in December 1990. So we were moving very fast. So from that point of view, you are moving rather slow. <laughs> but, um, but I think the key to understand it, it was fundamentally a constitutional crisis. And the constitutional crisis was because there was an attempt to move from a federation to centralization. So we had a very... Um, a, advanced federal constitution adopted in 1974, which provided republics and autonomous regions with uh, enormous amount of um, sovereignty. Uh, we had, in fact, in our constitution, the right to self-determination, including the right to secession, enshrined in the constitution. We had our own parliament. We even had our own constitutional court, unlike here in Spain, um, we actually had a constitutional court who could not rule over like your statut, like we couldn't, with that, our constitutional court in Yugoslavia couldn't do that. It could only rule that there was an inconsistency, and then the inconsistency had to be resolved through political means. So the constitutional court was very decentralized, and each Republic had its representative in the constitutional court, which is again a difference to here. But the very important thing is, is that there was an attempt starting from 89 by Milosevic to unwind the federation. So he first took over Kosovo, then he took over Vojvodina, and with those he got more votes in the federal institution than the rest. So he could outvote the rest of the country every time. So we call these the yogurt revolution. Of course, in Kosovo, he introduced emergency measures. 
And so there was an undermining of the Constitution. So w Yugoslavia is a case of a constitutional crisis. It's not a case of ethnic uh, craziness um, at all. It is the military wanting to remain in power and seeing centralization as a mechanism to do so. And the combination is one of constitutional crisis at the same time as an economic crisis. And at the time, Yugoslavia, we had 700% inflation. We had incredible amounts of debt that had been inherited from the 70s. And so there was a, a, a big divide in how the economy should go forward. And the call for the republics was to decentralize further, to liberalize the market. And the federal government, which was effectively taken over by the Serbs in this way that I've just explained, because they just got eight votes every time, um, they wanted to centralize. And so that was what the crisis was. So no, it wasn't inevitable. Had there been a willingness to allow for decentralization to continue, or at least not to reduce it, there would have been absolutely no desire of Slovenia to leave. I mean, I call myself a reluctant nationalist. I was not a nationalist to start with, and I still don't consider myself a Slovene nationalist, but there was no choice by the time it came. There was no, there was no dialogue. So the dialogue ended. So. That's so, so the Serbs, the Serbian elite, at least miscalculated the moves. Yes, I mean it's a combination of miscalculation. They would not have miscalculated had the West not told them that they could go for it. So the West was fairly clear, and there, I, when I say the West, I mean the European Union and America were very clear in their statements. Kiss Kissinger, Baker, Zimmerman they would come to Yugoslavia and they would say to the Slovenes and the Croats, stop being separatists and saying to the Serbs, well, if you need to use military force, you know, you'll sort it out very quickly. There was a very naive understanding of military force in the sense that there was a belief, Yugoslavia was a very big military force actually in Europe at the time. Um, it spent a lot of money on armament. Um, and there was a belief that the threat of use of force would be sufficient to scare everybody not to do anything. And so that, the miscalculation was that, that, well, it's, it's a, a combination of things. The Russian played a positive role in the Yugoslav case, because in the case of Russia, in the case of Yugoslavia, Russia told the Serbs that they were not allowed to use force at full extent when attacking Slovenia. So there were supposedly coded um, messages given to the army, and they had scales of one to 10 in terms of what force they could use, and they were only allowed to use five, which meant that they sent tanks to Slovenia, but they only gave them <coughs> gas or petrol for 24 hours. <laughs> they could have still bombed the parliament, though. Well, that, they, was number, they, that was force level They were five. not allowed to, well, they were, they were only allowed to lose limited force. And that limited force meant that Slovenia was able to respond because Slovenia was ready for that. So there was, Slovenia was ready, ready for all that happened. So when the tanks rolled, there were barriers built. Everything was ready. So there was very little surprises. But that was later, that was much later. That was when we proclaimed independence. <coughs> First we had the referendum and we had 88.5% of the vote. So that happened eight months later. So, you know, that use of force was limited. It was a 10 day war and we were lucky um, as to how it went. And so even though the West had said that this was an internal affair and therefore, you know, in a sort of way they were freeing mm -hmm. Belgrade to do mm -hmm. uh, something, you know, whatever they thought mm -hmm. was um, appropriate to maintain constitutional order in the way they were interpreting it. Things turn around very quickly, right? So... Well, for me, the most amazing thing is I was trying to, I was trying to find um, the actual um, original statement by the European uh, community at the time, ministers, 
two days before Slovenia declared independence. So if we talk about the timeline, we have our referendum on the 23rd of December 1990. We have 88.5% of the people who took part vote in favor. 90% of the people vote. So it's a endorsement, clear endorsement. We then have six months of things getting ready. And we announced that we will declare independence on the 25th of June, 91. Okay. Two days before, on the 23rd of June, 1991, the European Union says, we will never recognize you, and you will never be a member of the European Union. <laughs> and I, I have seen the articles where this is reported. And I have tried to get this document now from the European Union, and it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine things. So, and then recognition from Germany came very quickly, right? They were the first to move? Well, so, yes, Vatican was the first to move. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there was an announcement mm -hmm. already on the 16th of December, um, 91. So if we declare, so we declared independence in June, nothing's happening for al almost six months. On the 16th of December, the European Union announces that it will recognize us by the 15th of January. And that was at the insistence of Germany. So the Germany forced uh, them. But I mean, I think the Baltic states were amongst the first ones to recognize us immediately after the Vatican and Germany. So. So you help each other <laughs> yeah, somehow, somehow, somehow. So that's why, you know, I have sometimes, I think I have heard you uh, saying, you know, this thing of recognition by other states, you have a very positive, uh, you know, perspective on this. You, your take is uh, you know, very optimistic. And uh, do you think that if a small country in the corner of a peninsula in southwest uh, Europe would do the same thing, um, it would work in this way, or? I, I think so. I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decision that the people of Catalonia make. It's not a decision that the rest of the world makes. So it's up to the Catalans, and I, when I say Catalans, I mean people who live in Catalonia, to make the decision. Um, and then it's not, recognition doesn't happen overnight. It took, um, I think the United States recognized it's almost a year after uh, we were independent, um, and it's, business didn't stop, like, you know, uh, we could still withdraw money from the bank accounts, and um, businesses had things to do, so everything functioned, and in actual fact, unlike what Catalonia would have to do, we actually had to introduce our own currency. So on the 8th of October, when the mot we had to agree with the European Union, on a moratorium. So we declared independence on the 25th of June, and we had to agree to a moratorium until the 8th of October, 91. And we had to allow, and this was one of the things that I will never forgive the European Union for, we had to allow the Yugoslav army to re take their tanks and take them to Croatia, which, which is where they then used them. Unbelievable. So anyway, the moratorium finished on the 8th of October, and on the 8th of October, we issued our own currency. Now, so that's something that you wouldn't have to, be, have to do here. And it was very complicated, because uh, you can't just issue currency. So we had these coupons for a certain period of time, but they were very easy to falsify. So we had to move very quickly to a fully blown currency, Toller, which we had then until we went joined the euro. Mm -hmm. So, did uh, Serbia recognize you when, when, or you know, the rest of Yugoslavia? It's, uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, when, when, when rec did recognition well, I mean, happen? Well, Croatia, of course, and and all the others. Uh, Croatia rec made a proclamation of independence on the same day. That was as far as they could reach an agreement on, unfortunately. So, um, so they had declared independence on the same day, and they became independent. Um, on the end of the moratorium. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that, that was easy. I can't remember when Serbia, to be honest, recognized it. I, I think it may, may have been very recent. Okay, but still you conducted negotiations with the rest of, or, or with, uh, with 
yes. with Yugoslavia, right? Well, I think the, the key thing here is to understand that actually the negotiations that Slovenia had were with the, the creditors of, of Yugoslavia. So because Yugoslavia had no interest to negotiate anything with Slovenia, um, we didn't wait. We needed to have access to the, the capital markets, and we also needed to be recognized internationally. And so the first step that we did was to immediately engage with the IMF, with the banks, the private banks, um, with the World Bank, etc., and reach an agreement on what percentage of the debt of Yugoslavia we would take. Now that puts Serbia in a very difficult position because it didn't want to talk to Slovenia. But if it didn't actually know what was going on, it could end up with paying more debt than it was willing to pay. So we forced them in an indirect dialogue. So they didn't talk to Slovenia, but they had to talk to the banks. So in the end, the, the arrangements that Slovenia made with the IMF and the World Bank, those were the basis for the negotiations for everybody else. So we locked in our proportion, and then the rest was negotiated by everybody else. So that's very important to understand that you don't have to wait for a dialogue with Spain. You have a dialogue with the world, so you dialogue with them, and then Spain will have to come around at some point, but you have to be patient. How was it in uh, in the Baltic uh, among, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about all the Baltic states or just want to talk about I, Estonia. I, I You're welcome it, to either. You know, I think we have, a, we have a completely different experience. For us, the recognition of Estonia by Russia was fundamental. Because Estonia, when, Estonia um, in case of Estonia, the issue of recognition was a bit different because many of the countries of the world had never recognized the incorporation of Estonia into the, and the other Baltic states into the into the Soviet Union. So, for example, the United States had never recognized the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. So we had already been rec recognized as 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 the um, as an in as we were already recognized by the biggest power in the world as an independent state. Um, when we, we declared independence in, on the 20th of August 1991, we actually de restored, the legal restored the state that had, had existed before 1940. Um, the first country, we were ex waiting with a bated breath who will be the first ones to recognize us, and the first country was Iceland. Um, so in, in Tallinn, when you go to the, to the city centre, then that we, in honour of Iceland, we have a, have a square. So Estonia Minister of Foreign Affairs is, is placed on, on the Iceland square, which is in, in honour of them for having recognised him first. Russia, the, we were recognised both by the Soviet Union and the Russian Soviet Republic. So for us, we believe that the other countries would never have moved if these two entities had not recognised as an, as an, as an independent state. State. So I remember personally as well, we were sitting at the television, watching television, waiting who would recognize us. So there was a long silence until the Russians recognized us. And we had, because Estonia had very good relations with the Russian Soviet, um, uh, Russian Soviet Republic, and especially with Yeltsin, um, it was, we were able, we were able to, to move on this matter. And it was really, I, I really think that it was a casualty a chance, uh, a hope, whatever, whatever you call it, that that happened, that we could, that it could become become true. Because for us, uh, if if we had not been recognized by 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 the by big mother Russia and the Soviet Union, we ne the others would have uh, fled for the hills, and the Americans would have made a deal with them. <laughs> I can't comment on Baltic states. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, then, you know, after being recognized, you also engaged in negotiations with the Soviet Union, or it was not the case? Or we, we started negotiations, of course, because we had lots of, lots of issues to talk about. The most important um, um, of them, and that is an issue which is persisting, is the issue of the borders. Because Estonia recognized, its in, Estonia restored its independence based on the 1920 Tartu Treaty, which established borders uh, which were different to these other borders of the Estonian Soviet Republic. Estonia lost territories to, to the Russian uh, Soviet Republic uh, as a result of the, of the Second, Second World War. 
So this is on a, that is why why Estonia and Russia for a long time did not have a border agreement because there was not there was no agreement on whether although the, the the border has been officially marked for a long time there was no agreement on where it should actually run. Uh, another issue which was a, when it was an important issue for us is the uh, is is the issue of the Soviet army. Estonia became independent in, in August 1991, but the Soviet army and its bases were still in, and it took a long time. I think it was until 1994, 1995, until they actually left, finally. Um, and another, there were other important issues, such as the issues of, of, um, um, of the issue of money as well. We, we waited a year. We had Russian ruble for a year for the, for the monetary reform. We had the issue of, of the pensions of the military. Also, such issues had to, had to be negotiated with the Soviet Union. But I think compared to Spain and Catalonia, we were in a completely different situation. We, were, we had to basically, in 1991, Estonia was in ruins. Um, it, was, it, was over, it was over industrialized. It was not self-sufficient. It doesn't have a functioning uh, state institutions. It didn't have a political system. We had to start from scratch, and I think from, from that point of view, Slovenia was also different from us. We were basically, we started from zero. Our Estonian GDP per capita in 1991 was $5,000. So and now is? And now is, is, is four times higher. I see. OK. Four or five times higher. Depends how you calculate. Let me move on a bit, uh, since you know it, uh, it's 8:20 and uh, we have time constraints. Let's talk about Europe and the European Union, basically. Since I think that, uh, or I, that's that's how I see it, the Spanish government in all these uh, silent discussion that is going on over self the self determination of Catalonia, because you know, it's a strange type of uh, of game where. You cannot get, you cannot vote, you cannot really discuss anything, and, and so on and so forth, um, very transparently. Uh, has the European uses the European Union as the big card to um, make Catalans afraid of what will happen? Right. So there is this thing that if you vote independence, you will be excluded. Uh, today, I think it was uh, the Prime Minister of Spain, Rajoy, that said this. Uh, uh, full the ruta, so this uh, agreement uh, is terrible because it will imply that Catalans will um, will not be able to be a Spanish and European, right? And it seems this is terrible. Um, and so, so to what extent is this threat of expulsion, of exclusion, uh, real? Uh, both from a legal point of view and also from a political economic point of view, right? Because these are slightly different things. Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay. Okay, um, Anna. <laughs> well, I was nominated. <laughs> well, you moved first. To no, say, no, no, there was a finger pointing at me. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's like the hunter and you see a duck moving and you shoot to the, <laughs> you know. Okay. Well, I think it's, um, I think it's um, a threat that is not real. The reason why I think it's not real um, is because actually the Treaty of the European Union is entirely silent on this point. Um, the only relevant provisions that continue to be quoted are Articles um, 49 and 50. 49 is on application for membership and 50 is on withdrawal from membership. Uh, neither of which are relevant, in my view, for Catalonia. So therefore, there is absolutely no legal basis for either argument. Um, so um, the trick and where it becomes confusing is because of um, international law and state succession to treaties. And that r the rules say that in case of an application uh, or um, membership in an international organization, if you have a case of secession, then the seceding state has to apply for membership. That's the general principle. And if you have a case of dissolution, then all the parts of the former entity have to apply. And this was a very heavily fought argument in the case of former Yugoslavia. Um, it was one f which for many years for at least two and a half years um, was considered by most 
to be a, an argument that Slovenia and Croatia and the others would never win. Um, Slovenia and the others insisted that the case of Yugoslavia was a case of dissolution and as a result forced the fact that then everybody had to apply. Now why is that relevant in the case of the European Union? It's relevant that if Catalonia was to argue, which I think it should argue, that the case of independence of Catalonia results in the dissolution of Spain. And I think here you can actually invoke the statements of Rajoy to your advantage, since he says that Spain without Catalonia is not Spain. Well, we all agree. Um, then, um, I even your Article 2 of your Constitution is extremely helpful, and Article 1 of your Constitution is very helpful, and so is the history of Spain. Um, that all points to an argument that this would be a case of dissolution. Now, if it's a case of dissolution, then if the European Union wants to play funny games, then it has to play funny games with both you and Spain. And therefore, I think it won't play any funny games. That's my view. That, of course, it's all a question of how you present the argument and how you insist on the argument. Now, everybody, and I think just another important thing to make a distinction, it's not that you don't have to eventually agree that the rest of Spain can be Spain and that it can be the continuing state. You can do exactly what Russia and the CIS countries did. They initially agreed that it was a case of dissolution. And then when Russia realized that if it was a case of dissolution, it would lose the permanent seat in the Security Council, it went back to the CIS countries and said, let me take all the debts and let me be the successor state. And that was the deal that was struck. So I'm not saying that there is no ne negotiation. I'm saying, what is your starting position? And in my view, that should be your starting position. And in that kind of context, then the European Union has a much harder time. I'm not saying that even if you don't accept my argument of dissolution, you can't still argue that you remain in the European Union. I still think you can argue that even if you want to argue secession. Because again, as I said at the very beginning, there is nothing in the treaty that deals with the situation that would be the case in Catalonia. However, I think your argument is strengthened by the argument of dissolution. But of course, if we stick to the secession argument, then the argument is why is a person who wakes up in Madrid the day after the proclamation of independence a European and you are somehow not? Where, you know, where, what's the logic to this argument? If we're all European citizens, we remain European citizens the day after. So there is a, also a complex argument, legal argument, on citizenship that can be made if you go down the secession route. So there are many arguments that can be made, but I, I mean, I, I just wanted to mention some of them at this point. So let me, um, yeah. though, you know, backpedal a bit and ask okay. you a bit more about this discussion or argument on how to you know, the, how to characterize the, the, the solution of the Yugoslav state, right? Mm -hmm. You said we <laughs> argued over secession versus dissolution and then the forces that, uh, that were in favor of calling it a dissolution won. How, how did that happen exactly? So it's, it's kind of just uh, being a stubborn or, uh, I think or it's, it's just that Yugoslavia collapsed because I, all I, these countries I, all kind of, it's... I mean, I think it's, to, to, to I think it's a combination of factors. I think a combination of factors which um, you could say that our constitution, given that we were a federal state, it should have been automatically a suggestion that it's then a case of dissolution. And so the argument, for the, some say in the case of Spain, it can't be a case of dissolution because it's a unitary state. Actually, that argument works both ways because if something is a unitary state when a part leaves it's no longer a unitary state so then it's even more obvious that it's a case of dissolution um, it was a combination of things but it was an insistence uh, by um, uh, the 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 republics uh, and, and, I, and I, to understand this it might seem obvious now in hindsight that the dissolution argument in the case of Yugoslavia would be the one that won. But actually at the time it was not 
uh, likely at all. Neither the US nor the European Union wanted the argument of dissolution at all. They wanted Yugoslavia to remain a member of the, European, of the United Nations. They wanted that continuity. They were continuously backing them all the way. I mean, some would say that they even back them today. So it's, it's, um, so it was not an obvious. I think the key um, thing that swung things was the approach taken by the IMF and the approach taken by the EBRD which said, actually, what we will do is allocate the assets and liabilities in the IMF by a key. And, and so, um, I don't know, let's say Yugoslavia had 100 units in IMF, and they said, OK, Slovenia gets 16.32, which means the rest get this. So it was a case of dividing a pie, and so it's a dissolution. I mean, that's basically the logic. So I think, I think the involvement of death creditors in the discussion was actually extremely important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Alina, do you want to add yeah. to yeah. this? Yeah, I, otherwise, I have other questions for you, so don't worry. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm You'll get your chance I, to I talk. Would be, I would be happy to give a more political perspective. While I, I agree that it, it is hugely important how Catalonia argues, but I think it's, it, is not the poli it is not the legal matter, actually. It's a political matter. And the reality in the European Union is that a part of a member state, state seceding is a nightmare scenario for many, many states for a variety of reasons. The case of Crimea now has given one more reason for me, some of the states who did not have an issue with, with Cat, who, who did not have an issue with the issue of Catalonia or, Sc or Scotland before to be very, very, very worried. <coughs> so I think at the end of the day, it will be a political matter. If Catalonia declares independence, whatever it, it argues, it will depend on the next day where the political realities are and what the political deals were made. The European Union, if you look at, the, at, at its past track record, always finds a solution or it always muddling through is the ordre du jour. So it will muddle through and it will depend on its member states which route they will take. I think personally that it, it is not in the interest of the European Union to have a territory uh, with an undecided legal status inside the European Union and that, that a solution will be found. But to think that the arguments of Catalonia will make a very big difference, I think it's a bit too optimistic. So it's all about, you know, um, the fact that somehow but this this in a way seems to work in favor right because estonia you said was ruined so no one cared about estonia and slovenia is very very small i have been told that you can strictly ski place right you go no, if down you, if you put your foot very, very on nice. the gas you're already in austria okay you see <laughs> so so 24 hours of gas was a lot of gas <laughs> for the yugoslavia army but they didn't they didn't use it wisely or well, efficiently I mean. <laughs> uh, no, but 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 the, in the catalan <laughs> sorry, sorry in the catalan case you have you know tons of uh, firms and, economic interests uh, yeah so you have lots of you, you have lots of european citizens that seem to be very happy living here and non european citizens who have an interest in uh, you know um, yeah um, you know enjoying sun and everything you know here and so so that must will count for something right I think so too. Because I, I really think that a solution will be found. Just I, a solution will be I found. Just, I think it's very important to distinguish between the position of the European Union and the European member states before the proclamation of independence and after. So they are not going to support absolutely anything before. That's quite clear for all the reasons that were just mentioned. However, they are going to be highly pragmatic the day after. Um, because they're going to have to face the reality that they fa that they will face if they face it, assuming that's what you vote. So you know, you have to count on the fact that most many people think that this will go away, that this will never happen. So they are not going to get absolutely um, involved in this issue until it becomes real. So the reality of the politics is precisely what will play and the interests of the European Union and one of the most important interests of the European Union is continuity of borders 
They are obsessed with that. The reason for the enlargement into the Western Balkans is simply so they can draw a nice line so they have a unified Schengen border so it doesn't go zigzag in and out and all of that. So Catalonia is fundamental, not, not least because of the roads that connect the rest of Spain and Portugal to France and everywhere else. So these kind of practical things are going to be very important. So I agree that in the end it's politics, but it's politics based on arguments. So, so let me spend the last 10 minutes uh, on these, you know, there, there are lots of things we could go deeper into everything and so, but we'll have some time, you know, after the, the, the first discussion to do that, the first round to do that. Let me spend the last 10 minutes on this question of smaller states and bigger states. Um, I think I was, I was pretty young and, and well, it was not that young because, uh, you know, I was uh, already um, going out with my wife and uh, my father-in-law uh, was enamored with this book called The Small is Beautiful, oh, yeah. uh, which I think was a big uh, sort of uh, hit in the 70s or something like that. So is small beautiful and... Um, Are these countries uh, happier and uh, better managed? And uh, what do you think? What are the or you know, perhaps this is a qu difficult question and requires a lot of data that we cannot, we do not have. But so, in what ways are these countries uh, different from big countries? Right? What are the kinds of contributions that they have made to Europe, to the world, and so on and so forth? Who wants to go first? <laughs> oh no, no, you're the duck that is moving, so... No, 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 she was pointing at me. No, I wasn't that was pointing Elena, at me. go. No, I, I think the answer is, is, is really, it depends, because what, if you have to go also compare the situation with the alternative. For, for Estonia, the, staying, the Soviet Union collapsed, the, the, and it was not a sustainable system anyway. You would think that we are talking about the country that emerges from a dictatorship and from a very harsh one. The regime in Belarus is a joke compared to what we had to live for in the Soviet Union. So for Estonia, of, of course, the, the independence was the, the, the way to, to, to make its, its dreams come true. I don't think it, I, it is not necessarily the case for the countries. In, in case of Estonia, um, Estonia's dream in the 1990s, it sounds very boring, but our Minister of Foreign Affairs put it um, quite um, banally at the time. Estonia's dream was to become a boring Nordic country. It was the words of, of uh, Thomas Henrik Ilves. It is not yet a boring Nordic country, I must say, but it has become a normal country. And if you think of the country which at the beginning of the 1990s did not have a political party system yet, or um, had to dissolve the, the collective farms, had to privatize, privatize companies, had set up a flat tax system, and is now become one of the, one of the countries which ranks in the, in the top of the doing business lists, one has one of the most open economies of the world, is one of the countries, the second country in the world um, um, by the number of computers in schools, is one of the top countries in mathematics on the PISA list with Finland, um, it's one of the countries which, uh, who has managed to um, quadruple its GDP in, in 20 years. So in case of Estonia, I think the answer is yes, because for us, um, we, are, we are small, we are, we are very well governed. And, and even when, when I looked into, the, into this so corruption, because when one speaks about Eastern European countries, one speaks always about corruption and how the things are, are not very well. The level of corruption in, in Estonia is exactly on the level of, of any other country on the same level of, of economic and, and, and social development. So it's a normal, mediumly corrupt country inside the Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, well, I, happiness and the small countries. Yes. Um, well, I think small countries um, can be beautiful. Um, Slovenia um, is going through difficult times. Um, and I think the main reason for that is if it was a failure to appreciate the importance of the rule of law and the importance of independence of judges and um, the entire governance and accountability structures. And since it's a small place, unless you have 
these structures absolutely guaranteed, then things happen under the table. And Slovenia is suffering immensely from that. Um, and we have wasted an enormous amount of time uh, failing to do that. So one of the things that I would encourage you very much to do is to, you know, and I think a lot of people in Catalonia, at least the ones I'm speaking, speaking to, um, want our Catalonia, which is not like Spain. So there are, you know, independence of judges and things like that are, are important. So I think these are fundamental. And what Slovenia didn't do in that first wave of nationalistic excitement was that anything that was Slovene was absolutely fine. And everything, and so everything was brushed under the table and there was no attempt to uh, question anything because questioning anything was anti-patriotic. So I think that must not happen anywhere else. I think that was a fundamental flaw. I don't think anyone would ever, uh, well, not everybody ever. There are many people, there's a lot of Yugoslav nostalgia in, Yugos in Slovenia now, but it's not a nostalgia, I would say, to the return to Yugoslavia. It's more um, about um, aspects of multi-ethnicity which were lost in Slovenia immediately after. And I think it's the, I think it's very important to assure minorities, and we only had a small minority compared to here, of their position, and also to ensure that, I mean, Slovenia is a European country, it's a world country, it should have be an open country. So that is now something that is happening, but for a while it, it became, it started looking inwards, and that was a very bad uh, time. Okay, so I, what I see, and uh, you know, before we move into questions, uh, there is a, seems to be a tension between, uh, in small countries, between um, democracy and connections. Right? Uh, it's the government is closer to the people, and this gives, you know, sort of uh, makes it more accountable, and can experiment and do things and respond quickly to uh, to popular demands. But of course, there is this other component that pulls on the in, in the other direction, which is that people know. I mean, everybody knows every, everybody in the small countries, and that can become dangerous. And so one has to think about how to organize institutions so that this is kind of checked and controlled. I must say that we have data on happiness in the small countries. You know, I tweeted today about the economies. The economies uh, had this, has this data on happiness, and small countries, at least in Europe, are at the top mm -hmm. of the ranking. And um, among those countries, the individuals that are on a, you know, the, the sector, the, the class of people that are the happiest in Europe are um, Luxembourgish, no? no, 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 no. They are a Danish, uh, retired Danish women. <laughs> so, uh, so I think Estonian women also want, you know, probably want the same thing, being a boring, being bored and retired and uh, <laughs> live like Denmark and have their own kind of Borgen uh, type of uh, TV series. Um, so let me just now open uh, these to to everyone and see if uh, you know collects a few questions. Uh. Yeah, let's let's answer these questions and then go move to collect a few more. What the Estonians decided to do, I think, which was rather radical, is was to return all the properties that had been expropriated to the rightful owners, and that caused a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but probably was the only uh, was the right thing to do in the hindsight, but it caused a proper mess because you can imagine because. I just to give you an example, there were families who had been living in houses for 50, 60 years because the, the occupation lasted 50 years, which is, a, which is a long time in a lifetime, but still is a person's lifetime. There would be a family who had been living in a house for 40, 45 years, and then a family from Sweden came and they had to move out to the house and the house was sold on, on, the, on the market. So, but 
every everything was if if the if the state could find the owners, everyone everything was returned to the owners. Also, what was what was done with the rest of the of the apartments where people were living, everyone got got coupons according to, um, and there was a lot of corruption around it, and you could privatize the your own living space. So, a couple of years of complete mess, and I think some of the, um, um, but of. But I don't know whether the alternatives would have been better. Let me go to the question. Um, I don't questions. have the insights on the Vatican negotiations, so um, I can't actually tell you how they um, evolved. I can only <clears throat> give you some facts that are publicly available that might shed some light. So um, the uh, the head of the Demos party or the movement um, that won in the first multi-party um, elections was a Christian Democratic Party led by uh, Loise Peterle. They were actually very closely linked to, um, well, ca ca Catholic and Vatican and so on. So they had their own personal connections um, as a party and many, many of them in that way. And I think, don't forget that also Croatia was part of this and so and obviously Croatia has historically had um, close connections to the Vatican. Um, so that's probably uh, uh, one important thing to understand. The other important thing to understand in all of this is the importance of personal connections. Um, people underestimate uh, the power of this and you constantly think of states and governments and these kind of nebulous concepts of who makes the contacts. Actually the contacts are made by you, me, and everybody else. And so when you talk about the IMF and the World Bank, those were contacts that were made by the fact that people um, that were Slovene nationals had worked in the IMF and the World Bank and so on before. And everybody used every avenue uh, of, and any network that they had. So yes, the IMF is in theory um, <clears throat> made up of states, but actually IMF is a body and it has employees, and they will talk to you. That's the reality. So you, 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 know, you are talking at informal levels until the very end, and then it switches. Okay. Let me collect a few more questions. Uh, I had uh, you by the column. Yeah. The question was on taxes. Um, um, it was a, a complex, um, the Yugoslav way in collection of money was complex in the sense that you had, um, um, un unlike here where you put all the money into Spain and then they give you money back or give you less than you gave them, um, we had a different mechanism where we only put some of the money to them. So um, only certain taxes went to them and then the rest of the stuff was collected and used by the Slovenes and the other republics uh, for education and whatever else. So that, that's a, a very big difference. Now, towards the end of, the Yugosl of Yugoslavia, 89, the republics were really not paying any money anymore. So they were all putting money elsewhere and labeled lots of foreign uh, bank accounts and so on where the money was uh, being stopped outside the borders. That worked for independence because um, it allowed a cushion um, and so on, but um, it was also the, one of the main bases for corruption afterwards because the money was outside and then it just disappeared uh, into private pockets. Um, so it has um, a potential negative effect. But no, I think it's overstated to say that Serbia was using all the money. I think that's unfair to say. But towards the end, yes. I mean, at one point in time, in 89, um, the um, Central Bank of Yugoslavia simply abolishes all reserve requirements to Serbian banks. And in that way, they raid the reserves because the others had to put a reserve. And so they just went in and they took several billion. In fact, they, I think it's estimated that they took about six billion. And a lot of it is still today in Cyprus. I did not indeed speak about the ethnic issue. The Estonia, in um, just going back a bit in history to explain the uh, how the ethnic composition of Estonia came to be what it is now, 
1939, Estonia was a multicultural state, um, which had about 90% um, of the population was ethnic Estonian. And then the, there was a number of nationalities living in Estonia, including a high proportion of Jews, but also Russians, also, also all different kinds of nationalities. Um, during the, um, the Second World War and with the Soviet rule, Estonia went through a serious purge. Um, it lost around one-third of its population. Either they, um, they had to go to exile, or many people perished in the, in the, in the work camps of, uh, in gulags, in, in, uh, in concentration camps in, in Siberia. So um, lots of the, um, in addition to that, the, um, the Soviet Union was, was carrying out quite an active um, ethnic policy by, by, by taking people out. It was the so-called Stalin's land reform. They would, they would empty the whole villages, send them to, to Siberia, then replace them with, with population from different, different parts of the Soviet Union. So you can imagine that this kind of policies did not create a, uh, an atmosphere of, uh, of uh, happy coexistence. <laughs> um, in the 1990s, these kind of feelings were, were still very um, this kind of tensions and this kind of feelings in the, in the national, in, between the Estonians and the people who had, had come from mostly from outside from the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s were still very much alive. Um, there, are very, there, there are very few mixed marriages in Estonia compared to, for example, with Latvia or Lithuania where the mixed marriages were much higher. The Estonian and the, and the, and the Russian-speaking populations kept very much apart. There was also, um, also, um, um, a, um, the, the Soviet Union set up two different school systems. That was the Estonian-speaking school system and that was a Russian-speaking school system. The two school systems still exist. Also, there, there, was, there, was, um, there, was the, um, there was always on the national, national TV there was access to Russian news and always, of course, access to the, to the, to the, to the media channels in, in Russia. So, also, what played the role in the in the 1990s, I would say, is, is also the fact that that when the Estonians mobilized for independence, a big part of the Russian population mobilized against this independence. So it it was a, a, also another factor which which in the 1990s did not provide for a happy atmosphere of coexistence. So what happened in the 1990s is that the Estonians did Estonian new Estonian government did not trust its Russian speaking population. And the fact was that although the, our new government, lots of the people who were brought in to set up our institutions came from big Western universities and were, were bred and born, born and bred Democrats, they didn't actually know what to do about it. What do, what do you do if you do not um, trust a big part of your population? And the, and the decision which was taken at the time is, was not to give them a vote. So um, it's what Estonia decided to do is to, is to give, um, give, uh, give uh, citizenship according to the blood law. So basically, if, you, if one, of your, one or two of your parents had been uh, Estonian, had had Estonian citizenship and you could prove it, you would be, be, get Estonian citizenship. The rest would get citizens, could get citizenship through naturalization. And the official policy of the government went, was to let the people, the people to choose. So when you look at the, the data from 1992, 32% um, of the population had undecided uh, citizenship. By now, I would argue actually that the Estonian policies of integration and the European Union has played a hugely important role in this, um, have been actually quite successful because the number of people who have undefined citizenship has gone down to 6%. So, this, this one third of the pop most of this one third of the population has decided either for the Estonian citizenship or a very small minority for the for the Russian Russian, Russian citizenship. What exists in Estonia now for that is that um, the um, the Russian speaking population in Estonia has a very high cultural autonomy. There's a, there's a separate school system in Estonia. You have the right to get the education in the Russian language until um, until the end of the secondary school. Until uh, basically until university, the uh, the teaching in Estonian only starts in the 
part of the teaching in Estonia only starts in the secondary school, which are, in which case I think about 70% or 70 percent of the of the of the subjects are taught in Estonian. Estonia considers it's a good practice because it, it facilitates the access to the people to the to the to the um, to the labor market. The level of the Russian schools in Estonia is very very good. Estonia has one of the best school systems in the world at the moment. I'm, I'm not being very modest about it, but it does according to the PISA systems. And the Russian schools are a bit worse in it, but they are very fast catching up. So very very good very good schools. Um, there are Russian news. Uh, news on the in the Russian language on the on the Estonian um, on the Estonian uh, media that all the Estonian main newspapers are also published in Russian. The um, the people who do not have the Estonian citizenship have, a citizenship have right to vote at the municipal elections, although they do not have right to vote at the European uh, right vote at at the at the at the national elections. And if we look at the, at the um, at the, at the studies which are regularly carried out by the Estonian universities with the help of the Estonian government, the, the big part of the, of, of the Russian-speaking population is getting more and more integrated into the urban society. There is clearly progress. progress. There is also polarization. Uh, there is clearly also frustration. But if you think where we started in, from, from in 1991, I think Estonia has gone lo come a long way. Okay, well, it's one minute to nine. I'll, I'll answer very quickly and perhaps take uh, the last question and then we move to the beers and everything, which I, I know it's what you are, you know, dreaming about. Yeah, you are here for, exactly. I, I knew that, you know. So, on ethnicity, I think that in Galonia is an honest starter. With this concept of ethnically different groups doesn't exist. First, in, the first thing is that you know basically 80% of the population in this country has at least one grandparent that was born outside Catalonia so uh, it doesn't you know it doesn't resonate with the population to say you know you are here. second um, p politically there has been a story of both from the left and the right of making you know sort of um, in you know and this is something that resonates with the population that Catalan is the one that is lives here, and so there is this very civic construction of of identity, and I think it's sort of pretty strong. There are differences um, on you know in terms of position towards independence. That's a different thing, but but from there you cannot think of this as two ethnically different communities. Um, on the question of citizen, so that's I think why the question of citizenship comes from that. It sort of builds on that, and the uh, advisory council on the national transition set up by the Catalan government. We wrote a report on that contains our um, recommendations for this question and other questions on about citizenship in the transitory period till the writing of a constitution, if this is indeed what happens. And basically, our recommendation is that citizenship, Catalan citizenship, will be automatically given to those that have a Spanish citizenship today and live here. Uh, and so, and also those that are uh, do not, right? But they still keep that citizenship. So there is no exclusion according to any sort of uh, condition because the history is very different and which is you know I think and I'm, I think I'm going to close here because I know that you have questions but we can talk about this I think that what we learn is that there are things that you know it's fantastic uh, sort of material on the one hand I think we learn fundamental lessons that can be applied to Catalonia and I think that to me one of the most fundamental ones is this concept of constitutional crisis um, that the, the, the movement, that the, all the, that has happened in the last years in a sort of a slow motion, uh, you know, it, um, rather than fast, has, uh, has a, uh, is really related to a constitutional crisis. It's not so much an ethnic de uh, debate. It certainly has a, comp a correlation with cultural linguistic elements because that's something that 
you know, Catalan society values very much, this question of language and so on. It, it has, but it has really happened as, or triggered by this constitutional crisis where Catalonia feels a minority. That this thing that happened in Yugoslavia, that you know, this majority could roll, you know, roll over, uh, this is what we have experienced. And this, uh, this is something that is extremely, has damaged uh, the relationship with Spain. And when people ask for independence, I think that in fact what they are saying is that we want to have veto power so that in a way we are equals, because we do not feel as equals. We, as at least I'm speaking for those that are in favor of this, no, we do not feel as co-owners of the state. And that fundamental break of democracy I mean, since democracy, at least to me, is not just that one people, you know, everyone has a right to vote, which is also democracy. It's more than that. It's that you can take turns in governing, right? And it turns out that now we feel like we will never, never be able to turn, you know, take a turn in governing as co-equals. And that's what has, I think, what has triggered this, right? The second thing that I think was very important is all this question of, the international environment. It's so fundamental, the how we think about the relationship between what is going on here and the international arena, both in terms of laws, in terms of politics. Certainly the circumstances, but very, very exceptional that took place in the early 90s are not here. And in fact, in a way, the window, if I may say so, it's sort of closing a bit because Europe is very worried about Ukraine, is very worried about Crimea. Even the Estonians are worried about this because, you know, the recognition of Catalonia also implies recognition of other things and so on and so forth. This doesn't mean that it is not possible, it's just that we have to think about these things seriously. And the last thing is this about institutions, you know, to that cant small countries are of a particular type. They are not like France, because France is immense. I was in Paris yesterday and it felt like overwhelmed by Paris. And you can put many Barcelonas into Paris. And uh, when you go to the US, well, you can put, you know, not just one Barcelona, but a thousand Catalonias inside. And still you have a lot of space to, to, uh, to have cattle like cows and everything. Um, so it's a small, it has all the con constraints and all the advantages of being a small, and the question is how to design things so that you, know, you, you sort of harness all the potential of a small country and at the same time avoid all the traps that come with being a small. And so here I, you know, we should finish, but thank you so much for you know, sharing with us all, you know, thank you.